playbook that um, uh, that brings together our community action agencies and human services agencies together, looking at opportunities for um, aligning and braiding our systems for greater impact. Uh, we have a lot of exciting information to share with you from the release of our partnership playbook, and we're thrilled to have a number of folks from our Virginia team that is part of the spotlight of that playbook that's highlighting some innovative practices and some promising models for how we can think differently and innovate to bring our systems together in, uh, in solidarity around our shared vision. Um, so as to get us started, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead with some quick introductions as we bring our networks together today for a conversation. We want to give you all some context as to who we are and how we got here. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar um, uh, with APHSA, we are the American Public Human Services Association, and we operate as the National Bipartisan Membership Association for state and local human services agencies. So we work broadly with the, the public leaders that are responsible for administering some of the key economic and family supports that support the well-being and mobility of communities. Uh, and we do so by working both with agency leaders, their subject matter experts, and their critical support teams that are core to executing their mission. And I will turn it over to Lana to uh, introduce Community Action. Next slide, please. Yes, we're with the National Community Action Partnership, oftentimes known as NCAP or the Partnership. Uh, we're made up of a thousand and plus community action agencies all across the country, serving 99% of all the counties uh, in the nation. We um, have expertise, our members, our organizations that work at the local level, forming partnerships and collaborations and coalitions to address the causes and conditions of poverty. We also provide a wide range of programs and services to address the local needs of the service territory of those agencies. And what we seek to do is fulfill our promise of community action. And I'm gonna take 10 seconds to uh, center us in preparation for our workshop today by reciting the promise. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves community and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. Next slide, please. For our spotlight today, we're going to have our experts talking about their Virginia project. And we have Matt Fitzgerald, who is the director of the Office of Economic Opportunity in the Department of Social Services. We have Jim Schuyler, president and chief executive officer for Virginia Community Action Partnership, and Kevin Ott. Lee, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Hampton Roads Community Action Program, our local community action agency, who's a part of this particular project. Next slide, please. Myself and Matt will be facilitating and moderating the session today. And I am with the partnership, National Community Action Partnership, and Matt is with the American Public Human Services Association. Next slide. And I am thrilled and excited to have um, both Denise Harlow and Tracy Waring Evans as uh, here today to give us a welcome to this particular webinar. So I'm going to turn it over to Denise Harlow, Chief Executive Officer of the National Community Action Partnership. Thanks, Lana. Welcome, everybody. I will tell you that the, today is a culmination of a lot of work, um, a lot of excitement and multiple conversations that Tracy and I have had um, over the last couple of years. One of our members correctly was in the waiting area at Boston Logan Airport about how community action partnership and our member agencies can work more closely with APHSA and the member agencies and uh, departments and organizations across this country. When you think about the public human services infrastructure that APH brings to the table and the community-based nonprofit and public community action pieces that we bring to the table, that is the universe, the ecosystem, the primary um, response network to help families and communities thrive across America. Um, there are so many ways 
that our two networks can and already do work together. But there are some really fantastic opportunities to find new and creative ways to build bridges. And having both been worked at an organization who's a member of APHSA and now have also have worked in community action, understanding that the family is at the center of both of our networks. It doesn't always feel that way or seem that way or work that way, maybe from a, from a customer frame or even from when you're working in the field frame. But that's what we're here to do together is to try to figure out how do we blend and braid systems, money, services, infrastructure, to make sure the family is at the center of all we do. That is almost invisible to them in many ways about all the machinations going on behind the scenes. Now that's a big vision, but if we don't have conversations, if we don't strategize on working together, we're never gonna get there. So I am so excited by the launch of this playbook how we can work together at each other's training conferences and events and things like that. And having Virginia with us here today, um, Matt, you're just such a great partner on the CSBG side of the equation. And now with TANF and all of the elements that come together. And just a shout out, uh, this is Jim Schuyler. He's retiring later this month. So if you wanna give him a shout out in the chat, feel free to do so. So that was my chance to say thank you to Jim for his so many years of service to community action. And he's been a critical element too at the State House in Virginia. TANF has a role to play. Let's work together, Help community action, APHSA, public and private human services. We can change the world. So Tracy, thank you so much for joining us here today as well. And we so appreciate your partnership and collaboration. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Denise. And uh, it's uh, great to be with you and welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, as Denise said, our partnership across our national networks um, and with and through our leadership is not new, uh, yet I think it is increasingly um, full of synergy and opportunity. And you know, as we have worked together through uh, a common lens of the human services value curve, which has helped us think about how we measure our progress, uh, how we have a shared language to create generative and equitable community solutions. Um, I think we found a lot of ways to co-discover um, what it is that we can do to be more impactful and people and community driven in our work and understand how we can shift systems that actually work for people, um, where they dream, where they dream for their families, uh, versus what I think all of us know too often has been the case of um, us asking people in communities to have to work the system. Um, and so the opportunity, I think, in the lessons we've learned that have been illuminated over the last couple of years through the challenges of the pandemic as we've wrestled through um, the, uh, the greater sense of um, impact uh, we want to have for communities, um, that this playbook um, is one step to accelerating that impact and informing where all of us can best spend our time and energy um, so that all of our, our communities can thrive and flourish. Um, so I'm thrilled to hear more today from the Virginia team and I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. Terrific. Well, thank you so much to uh, both Tracy and Denise for, for joining us today and sharing those welcoming remarks to, to orient and ground us in, in, in this conversation. Um, so we're going to move on to the next slide and we want to um, spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so um, giving folks a uh, an overview of the, the full scope and uh, stories that we have captured through the partnership playbook. And we hope that this will be of use in sparking ideas and conversations between you and your counterparts and your sister agencies to uh, think about ways that we can work together to, to advance our shared mission. And um, on that note, the, the, the playbook itself really looks at uh, kind of four, four key areas to unpack around alignment of our of our respective networks. And, you know, Tracy and Denise did such a great job of talking about that shared mission uh, and kind of how when we center our work in the voices of the, the families we serve, um, our roles are interchangeable in how we work together to uh, meet the needs of communities. Um, we also, as Tracy alluded to, uh, have looked at our, in our playbook at a way we can benchmark 
and better understand the uh, progress and evolution of partnerships uh, between community action and human services agencies through what we call the human services value curve. And we're gonna share a little bit more about kind of how that as a lens has been a helpful way to really illuminate uh, the progression and partnerships and the ways that we can come together to get to root causes and community outcomes that, that we drive towards. Uh, from there in our playbook, uh, we, through a series of focus groups that brought together uh, key leaders in our respective networks, really drilled in on the most critical partnership opportunities that are kind of front and center in our, in our uh, view that we wanted to highlight for our folks to be thinking about um, as you look at opportunities for your organization to be partnering with your, your counterpart agency. Uh, and we'll, we'll share more there. And, and last but not least, of course, uh, we, we wanted to put this moment and this opportunity in the context of the landscape that we're in today as agencies have worked in creative ways to come together in the public health response and looking ahead as to um, how do we build towards a more resilient and equitable recovery and building uh, stronger systems for supporting the future. So uh, as we've explored these stories, we've really made an intentional point of understanding how our current experiences have shaped and informed the ways that we have come together in times of crisis to uh, be more resilient and responsive to our communities. Uh, next slide. So looking at those uh, those four areas and kind of having Tracy and Denise do such a great job talking about our shared mission, we're going to jump straight in and talk a little bit about kind of the human services value curve and how we use have used that as a foundation to uh, look at opportunities for partnership and measuring uh, and benchmarking the way that we, we come together. And I think the key thing to, to know for those who may not be familiar with the value curve is really it's a lens at looking at how we do our work that really centers our work and the voices of the consumer, the people, the families, the communities that we aim to serve. Um, and it's really been a tool to kind of better illuminate and understand how we're driving towards impact through our current work rather than introducing a kind of new framework or a new type of uh, way to, to be changing our, our work, but really to be honing in and refining our work to uh, maximize our impact and using that tool as a way to really assess partnership. And I, I'll, I'll share uh, on our next slide, if we can go, but we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in, um, in practice. Um, as we've kind of profiled some of the different examples that we've studied in the field of how state and local human services agencies have worked with community action agencies and how that partnerships have come together. Uh, we've looked across four different phases of, uh, of that human services value curve. And each of those phases are uh, incredibly important and critical to how we successfully advance our mission and kind of look progressively at how we uh, move from more transactional engagements to um, more blending integration and driving towards community outcomes through our collective efforts. So uh, as we've worked through our spotlights, we started really at the kind of the regulative phase, what we call, which is kind of really looking at how do we how do we deliver on what we say that we're going to deliver and making sure that we um, do our work and execute it um, effectively um, and how as folks as our stakeholder groups come together um, where we can achieve excellence there um, as we looked at some of the um, more creative ideas and partnerships for for alignment uh, we've increasingly seen more collaborative work where we can think about the, the menu of services that cross our different systems and how can we align those into a uh, collaborative no wrong door approach to helping families access the, the, the full range of supports that, that are needed. Um, increasingly, I'm excited to have the Virginia team here today to talk about their, their work is where we start to see opportunities for truly integrative partnerships. And that's where can we build on that collaboration to really get to understanding and tailoring solutions that get to root causes of uh, why families are showing up at our doors um, and needing assistance in the first place. Um, and last but not least, um, and I think this is um, something that we're always trying to achieve, and I think there's a lot of opportunity and excitement of how 
uh, from, certainly from our perspective and working with the kind of deeply in, entrenched community work that community action agencies do, um, we can kind of take that integrative work and create generative solutions that get to um, co-creating with our community the types of community level impacts that can uh, drive kind of systemic change that we're trying to advance through our shared mission. And um, if we go to the next slide, while we certainly talk about the human services value curve kind of focused on the, the discipline of our um, human services and community work, uh, I think the important thing is these concepts are not um, exclusive to the work that we do and can be thought about in kind of very simple terms. So just to give folks a little more context, um, when we talk about regulative and the kind of that, that compliance phase, how well are we just meeting, meeting the mission? Um, you can think of a person that walks into a drugstore because they have a cough, they have a cough. Are they able to get that cough medicine and does it work? Um, having excellence in how we achieve uh, that kind of basic function of, of our duty is kind of where we're looking at in the regulative stage. As we move to uh, more sophisticated collaboration. Uh, we're looking at how do we address the multiple needs that families have uh, by having that person maybe uh, having multiple issues that they need. Are they able to get all kind of the full range of health issues they have between a cough, uh, a bad ankle uh, to access um, and provide and get relief for, for all of those different symptoms that they're experiencing. Integrative is then where we start to understand why they're experiencing those symptoms and um, having the types of resources in a community that uh, is not just responding to that symptom, uh, but understanding the root cause of it and bringing to them uh, the, a different uh, type of treatment that gets to um, the root factors that are uh, contributing to that, that problem that has uh, come up. And then as we get to the generative, we're thinking at the community level. Um, we're thinking about, um, are there systemic challenges in the community around substance use issues, unemployment issues that might be contributing to um, these issues being pervasive within our community? And are we bringing in the type of supports that can um, more deeply impact uh, the, the symptoms at a systemic level? Um, so as you take a look at the playbook, you'll see this, this value curve as a way and hopefully as a helpful tool to better understand uh, both kind of the, the spotlights that we show, uh, but also for your own work. We hope that it encourages some, uh, some further thinking about where you are in your place on the value curve in your work and where there's opportunities to come together uh, to uh, deepen your impact. If we go to the next slide. So as we kind of get in, got into some of our really focused work around where are there the, the most ripe opportunities for us to be teaming together for impact um, through conversations with folks like Virginia, as well as through a kind of broad series of, of focus groups that we that we did over the course of last year, we really surfaced what we felt were three key areas that really stood out to us is where there is some promising work happening and where there's opportunity for more for spread and scale of these, these concepts uh, throughout our networks. And that's looking at whole family approaches, uh, thinking about two gen and meeting kind of comprehensively the needs of uh, families, parents and their children, um, looking at their full range of needs, um, SNAP employment and training, uh, how, um, public agencies that administer uh, SNAP, provide food assistance, can partner with groups like Community Action to uh, better meet the uh, employment and wraparound supportive needs of uh, families to uh, have economic mobility. Um, and then uh, meeting the needs more uh, of underserved communities and how through partnership can we come together to get underneath some of the structural inequities that are pervasive in our communities and within our own systems. How can we start to realign our work through a shared partnership model? So within the playbook, we dive into each of these three areas and showcase some of the promising models that we've observed through our conversations and landscape scanning that we've done. And I'll give you just a taste of that before we go into a deeper dive of the Virginia work. So next slide. So I'm gonna first start by uh, talking about SNAP employment and training. This is a relatively kind of new program in the life, uh, lifetime of SNAP and food assistance, um, uh, really kind of taking scale 
um, in the 2010s. And uh, we've seen uh, the really critical role of third party partners that uh, can work in concert with human services agencies to um, provide families that are participating in um, in SNAP to access employment and training supports. But really what's been key and enlightening in our conversations with um, it, through this project is the types of wraparound work and community tie-in that Community Action has and how critical that is to really advancing that mission in a um, truly impactful and, and, and lasting way. So we're, we were excited to really unpack uh, in Minnesota, the work of Tri-County Community Action and their partnership with the Minnesota Department of Human Services, as well as Community Services Consortium and their, their work with the Oregon, Oregon Department of Human Services to um, really collaborate in um, co-creating some solutions to address some of the structural barriers to employment and economic mobility that SNAP participants face. And where we really saw opportunity and, and promising practices was when state, uh, state human services agencies and community action agencies, despite the contractual relationship of this program, really came together in a more uh, collaborative and integrative way to partner in uh, kind of co-creating and, and uh, bringing to scale models that can get to the core needs uh, of families in, in the SNAP program. Uh, we saw really promising work around building infrastructure that can sustain this both on the public side around um, establishing databases that can uh, improve access for uh, community action partners to uh, tie in financing and resources from SNAP employment and training to um, strengthen their supports for families in their pipelines, um, as well as tools on the community action agency and to um, better uh, engage in and support um, the goals of SNAP ENT. Um, so this is a place where we've increasingly seen a role for community action. We uh, think that there's some promising models there around how we can seed and scale this work in community action. And I encourage folks to take a look more deeply at our uh, proof points in our playbook to learn more and to um, explore your own opportunities that might be available to you. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I'm gonna. I wanted to also flag uh, the, the kind of the one the second pillar of those air opportunities for alignment that we saw around different avenues for addressing structural inequities. Um, and we saw some very different approaches in very different places where community action and public human services agencies came together to co-create solutions. Um, a flag in Perry County where HABCAP, the local community action agency and the uh, Perry County Job and Family Services Agency, um, tackling deep rural poverty issues were able to uh, really through a kind of deep committed partnership uh, relationship building, trust building, uh, be able to create seamless services to address some of the kind of most deeply challenging problems they faced in their community related to mobility, related to access to internet, and uh, making services which are very difficult to access for, for, for folks that have barriers to coming into offices or to um, connecting with uh, resource centers. Uh, through co-location, through proactive uh, alignment of resources to get into the community, um, and through joint contracting to um, uh, always make sure that uh, we're not creating redundant systems. We're really effective at um, creating a kind of integrative collaborative system of service delivery. Uh, Montgomery County in Maryland, um, as a public community action agency that was in, that is embedded in the human services agency uh, is a really interesting model as well here where we've seen kind of the role of community action to really effectively build in lived expertise and community voice into the planning and implementation work of the, uh, the county human services agency and um, they have really strategically embedded that work into kind of throughout the organization um, and uh, built in training and resources, not just for the community, but in, in translating that for human services workforce to ensure that they can build kind of strong, solid, lasting connections. Uh, next slide. 
Um, and we're going to get a little bit more into it with the Virginia team. Uh, we do explore through both the Virginia work as well as exciting work happening in Western Maryland, uh, models for advancing whole family supports, uh, some really exciting work where community action has been a right at the table with human services to develop two gen models of service delivery um, and a really kind of shared accountability and ownership of um, how they address uh, the needs of families in, in rural communities and are, have been responsive during the public health crisis. Um, and I'm going to, I think the, the best way to really get underneath and understand these issues is to hear directly from the voices on the ground that have been doing this work. So I'm going to transition over to, to Lana, who's going to get us started with facilitating some conversation with our uh, Virginia team that has been doing some really exciting work to advance a two-gen model through uh, their DSS and Community Action Network, um, so we can learn more about that. Great. Thanks, Matt. And if you want to go to the next slide. So for some of you who maybe don't know as much about the Virginia Two-Gen Project, we're going to start with a little bit of a review of the project. So Jim, I would like you to go first and tell us, um, I know that the State Association was involved in getting this all started. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Thanks very much, Lana. Uh, both are State Association and our network, uh, particularly our leadership, were very involved. It really started when whole family work began, um, and, and the pioneers were Garrett County, Maryland, uh, and uh, Cap Tulsa in Oklahoma. Uh, some of our agencies have visited those agencies. We've certainly been in communication with national meetings. Um, and we very much were involved uh, in promoting the work of uh, Annie Casey and uh, Aspen Ascend, who were doing a lot of the evaluation work on some of the earliest work uh, in whole family. Uh, but the catalyst was the fact that two of our agencies received a grant from the US Department of Labor at the end of the Obama administration, and they started uh, in early 2017 uh, on a project that combined career coaches with job placement for parents and childcare for young people. Uh, and they worked with their Head Start program on it. And we were beginning to see positive results on that. But without the support of our state office, particularly our Commissioner of Social Services and our network, we would not have put together what was our, our first competitive grant program. Our network went along with it uh, and funding was going to go to a limited number of agencies rather than all agencies. And we had very strong support uh, in our General Assembly when we finally introduced what was just a couple of sentences uh, of budget language. Great. Thanks, Jim. Wonderful perspective from the state association level. Let's transition to the state office. And Matt, can you tell us a little bit about the strategies the state office used to get this going? Absolutely. Thanks, Lana. Um, and thanks, Jim. So um, as Jim was mentioning, we knew we had many community action agencies in the Commonwealth that had pursued elements of a two gen or a whole family approach some of them at high levels of sophistication, modeled after, as Jim was mentioning, like the Aspen Institute and Casey Foundation type models. But as it had been proposed, as it had been put forward by the network, this was gonna be a pilot project. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to learn as much as possible through the project. And the hope was that the results, whatever we learned from this would allow us to have further opportunities for the entire network. So we knew this was gonna be a small pilot project, but the goal was to get something out of it that helped the entire network. So we began with, we wanted to have both urban and rural focused agencies that were selected. So that was one criteria that we included. We also put in that we would have agencies that were at 5 million and below budgets and 5 million and above. So that there would be a mix of size of agency and capacity. So those were kind of some of the first initial parameters we set out on developing what we would do for selecting agencies. And then we, we looked at building a program design that was built around what 
all of us, the entire network. So this is our, our CSPG state office, VACAP is a state association and all the agencies had been talking about as key areas that were hampering overall institution of a whole family model in a network. So one of those was capacity. Every agency has varied capacity. Another was integration of programming and the ability to share and track data across your agency in different ways. So all agencies you know, do that to some degree and it's better or worse depending on how much capacity you have and the ability you have to kind of do that. So for the capacity aspect, we developed a program design that really emphasized the use of a family coach that would only work on this project. So any agency selected would have a family coach that was only gonna work on this specific project and would only work with five to 15 families at a time because we had lots of agencies that were doing case management. We really wanted to have coaching specifically and we wanted them, the coach to have the space and time to do it right. And then the last decision, one of the best decisions we made was that we decided to engage expertise beyond our own as a state office or state association or anyone in the network. So we conducted an RFP and we selected National Community Action Partnership to lead the initiative. And that allowed us to develop the plan to use like peer cohort models and regular training and technical assistance with that coaching aspect at the very center of the project. Great, thanks. And Kevin, uh, why is it that you decided to be a part of that pilot project as a local community action agency executive director? What motivated you to say, yes, I wanna be a part of the pilot? Again, thanks Lena and to all of my colleagues uh, on. Uh, when we looked at this pilot, program, we, want, we first looked at how this would align with our strategic plan. And we also had the idea of looking at coaching versus case management, and how could we look at breaking down some of the silos internally? Because we have, we're, we're great at doing programming, but sometimes connecting programs internally, uh, we would help individuals go through and maybe they wouldn't know they, they could talk to another program person. But so we looked at how could we take that entire family because we've always been ser served the entire family from Head Start. And so we looked at with our Head Start families having just 1400 Head Start families annually and children every day, how could we make sure that that entire family was provided the resources that they needed? And so we, engaged and looked at this conversation about having a coaching model. And before this pilot program came up, the agency was trying to find how can we no longer provide case management, but go into coaching approaches. And so when we looked at the Aspen Institute and other best practices, it was a, a, a no brainer that we needed to participate in this pilot and continuing to see the partnerships that we had developed already existing through community-wide initiatives, that this was just a natural fit for us. Well, thanks, Kevin. And um, I love that, that distinction around kind of investing in coaching a, a, as a tool. And, and that really helps lead me to, my, to the next question, which is, uh, as we shared in the broader playbook, whole family has really surfaced as a area of alignment that the community action and human services agencies have been able to rally behind and come together to uh, co-create some solutions for. But I'd really be interested in better hearing in this Virginia team's voice of kind of why, why whole family and why did this make so much sense um, for your organization to be collaborating in this larger effort to uh, advance a whole family strategy. And I'd love to start with, with Matt from the state perspective on uh, how this aligned with, uh, with your agency's work. Absolutely. So in Virginia, um, we've always called this connection of the Virginia Department of Social Services, the local departments of social services all across the state and the community action agencies, we've called it the three-legged stool with all legs supporting equally the different types of anti-poverty work in the state. That's been there since I began working at the state. And in particular, the work at the local departments of social services and the local community action agencies, they overlap in a lot of ways, or at least they complement one another. So at our agency at VDSS, we had already been talking about ways to in integrate whole family concepts into our agency, including we developed in our strategic plan, 
around the idea of using all of our relationships with sister state agencies, those relationships with the local DSSs, the other community partners, and all of the different divisions and departments we have within VDSS that touch families because we have Child Support Enforcement, SNAP, TANF, Family Services, Foster Families, Child Care, Refugee Resettlement. There's so many different divisions within our own that we wanted to first focus on sharing more data, planning on outcomes together, and then working across the silos in the same way that you do with whole family models. So in this project, one of the first things we looked at in the proposal phase when we were selecting all the different community action agencies was getting a detailed list of all the community partners that the agencies work with and how they work with those partners or how they wish they could work with those partners. So we knew from that initial selection process, we would be able to coordinate some of our own VDSS efforts and interests at better working with that kind of broad cross-section of partners in this work with the real-time way that CAAs were carrying out that work. And lastly, as a state agency, we were looking for additional ways to use data to show the ways that our work crossed over and supported the work of other agencies. So we wanted in this project to have a robust data and evaluation element, and it would be built on having shared data collection criteria, family assessment tools, logic models, and kind of shared understandings and definitions and learnings and adjustments throughout the projects as kind of a few examples. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. I, I love that concept of the three-legged stool and that it's obvious that that's been not just in principle, but integrated into the design and implementation of this, this, this project as well. Um, Jim, I'd love to get your, your speed feedback from the association perspective. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm going to be really direct. Uh, I think that the relationship that we had came well before our ability to do whole family pilot programs. So without Matt Fitzgerald and his team, without the commissioner of social services uh, and our leadership, including Kevin, uh, meets with the commissioner four times a year. Uh, we had talked about this. We knew what we could do best. And that was, we could get a piece of legislation that was very simple, uh, but left a lot of flexibility uh, for Matt to, to basically set up this program. And that was something we could accomplish in a, in a way we've never done before. We have never gone to our General Assembly or our governor and said, we want a five-year pilot program with a one-year budget. We took a risk. We knew we had to have two more sessions of the legislature to approve years two and three and four and five. We now have approval for the fourth and fifth year. So we took a risk that I think really turned out uh, to be very successful. The other is we said that we wanted to accelerate the development of whole family work within community action in Virginia. And we felt this was the best possible way that we could do it. I think it also gave us a, a degree of visibility uh, in the community and with our legislators uh, and with the administration uh, that said that community action was doing whole family work. Thanks so much, Jim. And Kevin, anything you would share from, uh, from the local level? Yeah, so on the local level, as uh, Matt and Jim had shared, one of the areas that made it best for us was that we had a guiding coalition or a service provider network already in place that allowed us to know and hear all of the connections uh, for most of the local nonprofits and some of the business leaders and economic development authorities. And that allowed us to utilize the database of Empower that the state helped us to uh, capture and use across the network. But we were able to use that to create presumptive eligibility and so that when we found that staff were able to go in and be able to put in some criteria and then be able to respond back, we saw that that was a great tool. But then we found that we really needed to not just address that immediate need and provide the service, but we wanted to have a linkage and connection so that when that family, when that individual was served, we didn't just stop we opened the door to get through all of the root causes. 
And we wanted to have someone that would be dedicated to that individual and that family so that when they needed additional services, they knew who to call. But then we looked at this concept then of how could we move it even more by providing comprehensive services. They check in with the individual every week. And we looked at not only how could we do this on a local level, but when we needed help, we could reach out to MED and to the National Community Action Partnership for support that would allow us to be able to continue to provide more and more services as we need. Great, I loved um, the comment about sim simple and flexible and bringing that to the table in order to make things happen. So that was enlightening. And um, I think that's true also, given that y'all got this started during the pandemic, during the start of the pandemic. You know, COVID-19 set in, that had to present some challenges but it also could have presented some silver linings, some positive outcomes because of that. So let's, let's explore that possibility. And I think we'll start with Matt to get the state's perspective of the impact the pandemic had on the startup and implementation of this program. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were a lot of challenges in the first, literally the timeline for the project. So if you think to the period the funding was made available in late 2019 we developed a project uh, program design and did all the procurement finished contracts december of 2019 and the mm -hmm. goal for family coaches was hiring by march 2020 so literally the coaches came on at the exact moment where the first realization that people would be leaving offices and we'd be working from home so the project literally started at the very beginning of the pandemic so it, it made it a challenge but what was structure wise really beneficial is that we had developed this process that was a peer cohort model so all the family coaches would regularly meet with national community action partnership at least once a month to go over what they were experiencing you know like talk about the challenges they had faced with working with their families or working with the data or any of the specific elements so those regular meetings with the coaches to discuss those challenges the regular check-ins and trainings and technical assistance and that dedicated expertise of a National Community Action Partnership to troubleshoot and give back feedback and ideas was really important to the adjustment. And it also worked out well in one way because uh, we have six agencies all across the Commonwealth spread out greatly. So we really, we're, we needed to use virtual tools and processes anyway. So it actually did fit with what we needed to be able to do that communication model of working together on coaches. And, and one last silver lining, is that there were challenges in families facing lots of different things because of the pandemic that have allowed for some unique approaches and partnerships like addressing mental health and things like that. And I know Kevin and HR Cap has done a great job of working with some of those kind of specific elements. Nice transition, Kevin. It had to be uh, a little tricky there at the local level, um, implementing it at a time when everything else was changing. How'd you do it? And what's some of the positive from that? So all I can say is, wow, when we, uh, <laughs> when we started and we just, <laughs> I remember in, in January, we had just uh, started the project and it was getting straight at COVID and we were looking at how do we move forward. Uh, we had looked at staffing and at first we were thinking, let's try to post this position out and you know look for some external candidates. But we said, we, we know we have some great case managers and coaches in-house. And so we identified someone in-house to do. And we started looking, well, we have families, we have individuals and households that we're already serving. So how could we create kind of an information session to talk with families, to tell them about this approach, this concept, and who across the, were in various crisis to thrive model solutions of where they felt that the individuals they were working with. So it helped us that we already had a niche. We already had households that could be identified that they were being worked with. And so what we did uh, is we started having a peer support group meeting. And so because we couldn't meet in person, we took it straight to Zoom. We started with WebEx and we had to teach individuals. And then we found out how can, well, well we got to get internet to them. So we had to buy mobile hotspots. We had to get laptops. We had to do a lot of various innovative ways. We had to find ways that they could give us all of the information by scanning. 
uh, documents because we needed to do if they needed services. But what we did is we partnered with the local social services to find what tools that they need to have so that when they needed that warm handoff, we had those results. But then later as we moved in the process, we identified that mental health was a, a very need uh, situation because we couldn't get to the, the, the root cause. So what we did is we went out and we contracted a licensed clinical social worker to come in and work with our uh, families every other week and then do one-on-one -on -one counseling so that we were able to get to the root causes to address and then continue to move forward in that coaching model. So a theme that I hear over and over again, uh, doesn't matter who's talking, if it's Matt, Kevin, or Jim, is the importance of relationships and partnerships, and that is being displayed out uh, in your comments. So Jim, we're going to close it out from the state association perspective. What was some of the positive? What were some of the challenges? And how did you do it? Thank you, Lana. This is the one we have the least to do with, so I, I can summarize <laughs> in four words. The first is the one I gave you earlier, flexibility. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we had budget language. We did not have restrictive legislation that would have meant that you would have had to have some kind of very specific program model. We left that to the department to come up with it and have the partnership as a, the, the kind of overseer and evaluator. The second is evaluation. This was a five-year program with a six-year plan for independent evaluation. Yeah. For one person who will no longer be around, I would suggest very strongly that part of that evaluation is how do you deal with a totally unanticipated mm -hmm. crisis? And the fact that they were able to do this is in itself remarkable. The fact that they kept families intact frankly, was due to the flexibility of funding so that they were able to provide them with emergency services mm. to tide them over and continue to look toward what do they dream about? How do, mm. how do you keep them motivated and positive? That really is worth some study. And the last is really very simple, prayer and strength. <laughs> and I would say that helped get a lot of people through the last two years. Um, I am viewed as a, an optimistic person generally, and I know in the work that I try to do, I try to keep people motivated and looking toward the future. I think the fact that we kept a program intact through that two-year period uh, is nothing short of remarkable, um, and I think we can build on that to something that is more lasting. Great. Thanks. Well, kudos to you all, uh, and, and I, I, I want to just round up one one last question for, for you all. And I think Jim, you, you you kind of alluded to this. A lot of the hard work that led to this initiative being launched like, happened well before a piece of legislation was introduced to develop funding. And I think about the kind of the truly like integrated work that you all are doing to get to root causes of 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 supporting families and, and meeting them where they are. And kind of as we looked at, can you all, your all's work on along the human services value curve. One thing I know is that that doesn't just kind of magically appear out of thin air. There's a lot that goes into getting to that place. And I wanna understand some of the secret sauce for like what, how you got to that point. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the relationship building lessons learned on what it takes to have a long lasting sustainable effort like this. And Kevin, I wanna start from, from your perspective because you're the one that's actually doing this work on the ground. Sure, so again, I think it starts one with the way our board structure is set up. We utilized our board members for their connections and to help us to open doors that we needed to continue to build upon. Uh, from all the various sectors, low income community, we needed to make sure that we had an opportunity to be able to serve and let individuals know through their networks. And we used elected officials to be able to help us to guide and braid additional funding that would be available to us. And then also we used elected officials to help us to navigate through some of the MOUs that we needed to put in place with some of the providers. If we didn't start at the top, sometimes it didn't help us through navigate through the issues. But then as we moved through the MOUs with those organizations, we then met with the individuals that were gonna be doing the work. 
so that when our coach needed to connect, they knew exactly who they were to connect to and had the information. But the other part was, again, meaning access and assessing partnerships is all about this whole co coaching model to be able to help all of the families. But then having the connection to early childhood education was another core component because we found that if they didn't, that wasn't a solid foundation, the families could not move forward with any job skills that they needed if they were underemployed. So we found that we had to go and continue to find collaborative work to work with our partners. But as also as we look at this curve, we had to go back and look at the various stages of where we were in our learning process. And when we first started out, we thought we were going to be doing something totally different. We didn't know that we were going to be having a dedicated licensed clinical social worker to help us. But we didn't know that we were gonna need an employment coach that we're gonna be dedicated as a coach as well to assist these families. And, but we worked with all of our local partners and state partners. And as we looked through this entire curve and going through the lens, we were also trying to look at the outcomes. How could we really make sure that when a family felt like they were at their level of need, we were still able to continue to monitor and reach out and be able to track those outcomes so when we needed to report, we could. So it was a very good le lesson learned but we're continuing to learn through this pilot so we can continue to share across the network. Thanks, Kevin. So Jim, if, if Kevin was is the one that's putting this into, into action, you, you were a key part of bringing this into life. Any lessons learned for and reflections for others as uh, you move on towards retirement? The first thing, Matt, is all of us, believe that whole family approaches to multi-generational poverty uh, really is the most effective strategy to help reduce poverty. I think if you went into this with a questioning environment, uh, that would be different. I think we went into this with the expectation that we would be finding results. They may take years uh, to get there, and they may be delayed some, to some degree because of, of the uh, pandemic. But ultimately, we saw that. I'm going to pivot to your generative point. Um, this is not a success in my terms unless we meet the acid test. And that is that the pilot program doesn't end, and the pilot program is institutionalized intentionally. Uh, by as many of the six agencies as we can get. I've done this work long enough to know we don't always get 100% success rate, but that's the acid test of success. And I, I think that we are really focused on community level out, uh, impacts as you are. We are looking at systemic change, but systemic change requires organizational change. And Kevin told you about some of the changes that, that had to be made at the agency level. That's where it's going to, to succeed. Uh, the other is we really are looking to accelerate the adoption of this. And we're moving now to train more of the network uh, in developing uh, whole family strategies as well. Thank you, Jim. Matt, any, any final thoughts on that, that point? Um, I think just overall, the concept of trust, respect, and shared desire for innovation that was brought about by all the conversations we've had over multiple periods, like both Jim and um, Kevin said, enabled us to do all of that uh, planning and work. And I think not having any specific, it fits on the, the list that you had from, you know, regulative down to generative is that there are no specific roles, even though I am in a state office that has a regulated regulative responsibility that is one aspect of a specific role and working towards those other aspects is, you know, a, a, a good thing to do. And I think advancing on that in this project towards thinking about what we were trying to accomplish as a network instead of looking at the regulative aspect has helped. Great. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions in the chat. So Matt, I think you should just keep your microphone unmuted 
couple of questions, I think mostly directed toward the state office. Did the social service partnership extend to other services like child welfare, child support justice issues, which are often key elements and barriers in family service? So the, the project is funded through TANA funds and had the specific whole family aspect. So there was no other aspect where we changed anything related to programming, but I think what would have, what does fit into the question is that the relationship with the local DSS by each agency is a key component of their mm -hmm. actions in the whole family. So working with the local DSS to address with their families, all of those specific elements is an important part, but there were no changes made to, you know, regulatory or legislative changes made to any of those programs to make anything better. Um, I think the learnings from this specific pilot project though will inform like if some of those things are barriers to people getting out of poverty, then that'll be lessons that will help us from the pilot project to say, we need to have changes in those specific. Great. And I think it's important to note, I was just in human service value curve training this morning that in order to really be a strong initiative, you've got to be really strong in your regulative practices. If that isn't in place, it's really hard to move forward. So that is an extremely important piece of the human service value curve. Um, so I just want to bring that to everyone's attention, making sure that those regulative processes and systems are working effectively. And if not, as Matt said, you have the opportunity to change, but having them doing their job is important. Um, next question, again, I think, Matt, for you, can you speak to any efforts to address different income eligibility between the programs? Was there legislative or regulation that allowed for eligible eligibility for one program or service eligible for all? So I think this kind of goes to Kevin's conversation about braiding funding. So the, the funding was TANF funding. So for the elements of the project that were funded out of the pilot project, it was 200% of poverty eligibility. But with any family that you work with, Kevin's you know, HR cap is working with multiple families that they're trying to put together many services with many sources of funds. So although the funding for this project might've paid for the family coach or some specific element of service that would have some restrictions around the 200% eligibility, HR cap has other sources of funds and other ways, especially any discretionary funds that they can use to go around those. But the ultimate crux of this question, the benefit cliff and the eligibility issues are things that we deal with all the time. And we're trying to find ways, you know, through universal basic income or other types of avenues to have flexibility. And again, I think the learnings from this are gonna point to the fact that flexible funding is the only way we've been able to support really families in specific elements, there have been things that have come up that there was not funding available for in any form. And so families have not been able to advance as much as they should because of that. And I think that'll be a learning. All right, thank you. Matt, that's it for our questions. So I'll turn it back to you. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thank you to our Virginia team for, for sharing their story. Uh, we will be sending out the recording in the next few days. Uh, so keep, a, a keep an eye out for your inbox and uh, we encourage you all to take a look at the playbook to explore more stories and ideas for how you can be doing this work in your own community. And we look forward to all the work ahead. So thank you all and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Yes, and I extend our appreciation as well. We have contact information there on the slide. If you want to dig a little deeper, uh, feel free to reach out to Kevin, Jim, Matt, myself, or um, Matt Fitzgerald. So I forgot we had two Matts on here. So again, thank you all for joining us today. And we very much uh, appreciate your interest and do look forward to what happens next. Thank you.